Welcome everybody to Pathways Continuing series of seminars. Today we're going to be talking about maintenance and outage planning. Most petrochemical facilities operate from anywhere from three to five years without stopping. And when they do, we have a limited time in which to accomplish the needed maintenance. It's only about 21 to 40 days. So as a result, pre-planning and inspections are extremely critical. Now, the most important thing about an expansion joint inspection is that I don't believe in them. That's because an expansion joint is intentionally the weak link in a series of components. And in order for the expansion joint to operate properly, all of the other components in the line have to be working well. As, uh, working well. So we'll take a quick look at all of your spring supports, anchors, guides, nozzles, flange connections, to make sure all of these components are in good working order. Now we'll start taking a detailed look at the expansion joint. We generally like to do a hot inspection about a year before the outage or before the budget closes. And we will do an evaluation in the hot condition to give you additional information on what to and not to do. The hot inspections will be consist of walking the line and looking at the components, but then also marking the system in both the hot and cold condition. We'll check the bellows for squirm. Here we see examples of an inline or an inline squirmed bellows element. We unfortunately can't check for corrosion and pitting, but we can look for mechanical damage. And here's our uh, favorite squirmed picture. And then uh, corrosion. Here's a, an example of where someone painted the bellows, which is always a, a bad idea because it traps moisture between the paint and the bellows element and accelerates the corrosive process. And then we'll look for mechanical damage of the bellows element. This picture actually was where uh, the scaffolders decided that the, uh, putting a leg of a scaffold was a, uh, on our bellows elements was a good idea. When looking at expansion joints, for hardware, restraining hardware, hinges and tie rods, it's important to track the load. In earlier sessions, we talked about these restraint mechanisms could be uh, restraining up to six to 100,000 pounds of pressure thrust force. And so that means the tie rods, hinges, pins will all be restraining a massive amount of force. And so we should be checking and looking at all the welds and mechanical attachments that are restraining that load. One of the things that we're especially keen on is rings on large diameter piping. So this picture shows if you were to do a temperature profile of a 1400 degree expander inlet line, the temperature on this ring would substantially reduce. These are actual field measurements where the media was at 1400, the idea of the pipe dropped to 1350, then 13, the mean temperature of the ring was 900, and the OD of the ring was at 600 degrees. Now if you were to calculate the radial thermal growth at these temperatures, you would find that the ring does not expand radially anywhere near as fast as the, as the pipe. As a result, it was almost like putting a tourniquet on your hot pipe. It will squeeze the pipe and prevent it from growing radially. This will cause extremely high bending stresses at the toe of the fillet weld attaching the ring. These stresses are not high enough to cause a fatigue or initial startup uh, failure. However, they're high enough to induce fatigue stresses into the base material. The cracks will propagate from the ID to the OD at the toe of that fillet weld. So the only way of finding these cracks would be to go on the interior and do a dye penetrant test. And as I said, the fatigue stresses will accumulate over time until eventually you get a through wall crack. Unfortunately, the traditional method for repairing this crack, grinding and rewelding, uh, would be unacceptable because the base material you're, uh, you're welding into is already fatigued and bad. And so you'll just propagate the crack even more and you end up with a process called chasing the cracks. Now there have been some uh, plants that have had limited success attempting to do an in-place deep solution anneal of the fatigued area. And this could prolong the useful life of uh, the equipment for one, maybe two uh, 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 campaigns. As a result of the problem we had with rigidly attached rings to hot wall pipe, 
pathway developed the floating ring concept. Now this is where we make a, uh, a dummy leg coming off the expanded pipe and then we have large heavy rings that bear against those dummy legs and there is no welding. And this way the, the expanded pipe portion of the expansion joint can readily expand at a different rate than the floating rings that are restraining the hinge uh, plates in this picture. I've never seen a floating ring fail as a result of uh, restrained radial growth. And so they've become a, a standard for all hot wall applications and really all large diameter applications. And this discussion would apply not only to expansion joints, but spring hangers, guides, and anchors. I've seen spring hanger rings fail as a result of restrained thermal growth as well. So you may want to take a look at that. Also, I've seen failures of rounding rings uh, and fit-up rings that were left over from the initial construction that uh, were never removed and they're causing this through-wall fatigue cracking. Next thing to look for is welded cones. Here again, if you look at the temperature distribution of a welded cone, you'll see that we have you know, very high temperatures on the line side on the right, but then it drops down to you know, maybe 600, you know, 500 degrees at the bellows attachment. This will cause bending stresses in that transition piece. The maximum stresses will occur at the welds. And for this reason, the industry had a number of failures at cone uh, welds. And the industry responded by developing wedding keg expanders. These are um, tools that are capable of taking straight pipe and expanding a bell into them and eliminating the two welds at the peak stress points. And to my knowledge, we have never had a failure of uh, an expanded pipe segment like this. And as a result, the industry has all but eliminated welded cones. Okay, the hot inspection will also include uh, taking the bell's operating temperature to apply pressure test, measurement of movements to compare against theoretical, inspection of the hardware, a review of the drawings to see if there are any known manufacturing techniques that could lead to future problems, and a review of the historical information, i.e. how often have you replaced this joint and why. If you've been replacing it every campaign, then there may be a systemic design problem with the line, and a better type of joint might serve you better. And then finally, evaluate its operating conditions and options. One of the critical factors to consider when evaluating the long-term health of an expansion joint is the bellows' actual uh, operating temperature. We offer bellows with thermocouples attached that will allow you to uh, record and monitor the temperature. We like to see the bellows operating somewhere between, you know, this slide says 300, but there, we found that there are some high temperature sulfides that can condense um, in that up to 400 degrees. So a tree safe range is somewhere between 400 and 900 degrees. So you can monitor your bellows operating temperature. And if you see the temperature start to drop, it could be an indication of catalyst packing in, in the interior. And as the, or, or coke formation, if it's a hydrocarbon line. And you can monitor this, and as it gets down between, in the range of four to 300 degrees, you know, know that it's time to take some action. Conversely, if your temperature is trending up, could be an indication that you've lost insulation or refractory, and your action line would be around 900 degrees, where we'd have to take some action to remedy the situation. Probably the best thing you can do in evaluating an expansion joint short term is perform a two-ply pressure test. If your bellows are a two-ply testable bellows, you can test them online by removing the red top, attaching a pressure source, normally an inert gas of something, some sort like argon, an isolation valve, and a pressure gauge. And what you can do is pressurize that very small space in between the plies to about 10 to 15 PSI, lock it down, and then monitor the pressure gauge to make sure that it holds pressure. This way you can monitor or verify the integrity of the inner ply, the outer ply, the attachment welds, and the test monitoring system. Now, if you were to have a leak, 
normally on the outside or test support connections, uh, that is repairable during the outage in most cases. Very rarely will you have an actual bellows crack, but more likely a, uh, a crack in the attachment weld or in the test monitoring welds. If you were to have a, a leak on the inner ply, that should show up as the operating pressure on the gauge and that would tell you that the inner ply is gone and you're now operating on the outer ply and you should address that problem during the turnaround. So as far as short-term evaluation, the two-ply pressure test is the best thing you can do. As far as age of the unit, Pathway has the philosophy that uh, we will not even inspect an expansion joint older than 30 years. It will be a verbatim condemnation. You have to, you know, we recommend you replace it. You've gotten your money's worth, go buy a new one. Um, and so after 30 years, it's impossible to predict what's going to happen. But a few ideas on how long expansion joints last. A regenerator stand pipe, you know, for example, will operate from 15 to 20 years. A spent catalyst joint would operate, here we have 20 to 25, I'll bump it from 25 to 30 years. They almost never you know, uh, fail. Third stage separator, 20 to 30 years because they don't do too much. Fluid gas will be entirely dependent on the operating temperature. If you can get the operating temperature in the four to 900 degree range, there's no reason that they can't last 20 to 30 years. Expander inlet line joints would operate you know, about 15 to 20 years. And the reason for the short run is because of the stainless steel well sensitizing over time, not because of a bellows problem. So once you know, we've done the hot inspection about a year to a year and, uh, and a half prior to the turnaround, we would make recommendations and execute them. And then once the turnaround starts, we'd go in and do a cold inspection where we would repeat many of the steps we did in the hot. But then also we would uh, go in and look at the internal liners, liner seals, liner gaps, refractory dams, and evaluate the internals of the joint and make repairs and modifications as, as necessary. During your uh, outage planning, uh, you have options. For uh, If we found a joint that had a problem, say the inner ply is leaking, uh, it does not always necessitate replacement of the entire expansion joint. You have options, and the first option I'd like to talk about is what happens if we do nothing? Uh, that's management's, always management's favorite thing to do. Uh, they do nothing. Um, and then we have same size clamshell, in place refurbishment, shop refurbishment, and new. So let's take a look at a couple of these options. Doing nothing um, is an, always an option and could consist of engineering out the expansion joint. Uh, there are many plants where an expansion joint was dropped into a piping system simply because they did not have the capability of doing pipe stress analysis to justify not using one. And so they're in there for a fear factor, and in many cases, the joint can be engineered out. Next option is boxing an expansion joint in. Uh, a lot of the expansion joints we sell have heavy sealable covers. These are plate covers that can be welded shut in the event of a bellows, bellows failure. Uh, I often warn end users to be very careful about this option because that expansion joint was there for a reason, to absorb thermal growth. And by boxing it in, you've eliminated that capability of absorbing that thermal growth. And you need to ask yourself, what is going to take its place? And I have actually seen nozzles torn out of vessel walls, um, anchors shear off, you know, a pipe rip, uh, and a lot of uh, some pretty nasty things as a result of boxing in an expansion joint. And I know a lot of people will say, well, we'll just operate, and if we see we're coming down, we'll run out real quick, and we'll you know, cut the box off. And that's a nice thing to say, but at 3 o'clock in in at night, on a Sunday night, you know, sometimes it always you know, doesn't get done. And so be, uh, boxing in an expansion joint is something I urge people to take great care with. Okay, next option on your turnaround is called a same size clamshell. And what we're gonna do is up here in the, in the right hand corner, we're gonna take that bellows that's there now and assumably leaking, we're gonna strip it off and mount a new bellows uh, that is a same size clamshell. 
we do this a lot on heat exchangers where it's not possible to replace the expansion joint with a brand new assembly. And it's sometimes considered a, a permanent replacement and done with uh, two longitudinal hand seam welds. First step would be to take off the old bells and we'll grind the pipe uh, smooth and clean the shell. Next step is we'd put on standoff rings and then a copper chill bar. And then the final step would be to make a perfectly or make a single ply bellows element, cut it in half, bring it out to the side, and then install it on the standoff bands with the chill ring. And that's where we get our hand welds, where we would weld, make two hand longitudinal welds across the bellows element. Pathway has eight welders that are certified to do this weld. It's that critical a weld and that difficult to do. The next option in turnaround planning is in-place refurbishment. This consists of removing the existing covers, bellows, internal insulation, liner, liner seals, and creating a gap with which a, a new bellows, a new shop welded two-ply testable bellows can be inserted in the gap. It also requires us to be able to disconnect the pantograph linkage so that we can draw the center spool down to get a large gap. Once the bellows is in and mounted, we will take the center spool and compress the upper joint and insert a new bellows on the downstream side. Bring the center spool back to neutral, attach the pantograph, attach all four bellows circumferential welds. We'll then have to go on to the interior and reinstall that internal insulation, reinstall the liner and the double leg you know, refractory. So many times, especially uh, this is an economic solution of mounting new bellows, especially when the joint is buried deep inside the heart of the FCC structure or the plant when the joint really can't be removed economically. One of the uh, factors to consider is what else is going around uh, this expansion joint. Many times there's a slide valve directly downstream which will require course, co close coordination between the slide valve uh, crew and Pathways expansion joint boilermakers. And timing is always critical and any sort of surprises and an in-place refurbishment uh, could impact the schedule. And so for this reason it's recommended to have a very detailed inspection to make sure that the carcass is worth saving. But in a lot of cases, an in-place refurbishment can be an economical and timely option in the turnaround plan. Shop refurbishment is an option in turnaround planning. This is where you cut, cut the expansion joint out, put it on a truck and send it to our plant or a pl uh, fabrication yard close to your refinery. Many times we've done a refurbishment at the refinery uh, maintenance uh, building. But anyway, it would require that the joint be cut out, lowered onto a truck, sent to a shop, or we'll take it apart gently, remove the existing bellows, internal insulation and seals, and uh, clean the joint up, mount new equipment, and then send it back to you uh, for installation in, into the system. One of the considerations when doing a shop refurbishment is, is the body where our carcass worth saving? Uh, has the uh, line material sensitized as a result of high temperature? Chromoly decays over time and it's difficult to weld and so if you're looking at refurbishing chromoly, I would recommend a weld, weldability test be performed on the chromoly before making a final decision to send it out. And then corrosive pitting around the bell's attachment area. Generally, you know, refurbishments are generally done where we have very heavy, hard uh, hardware, or where it's very difficult to remove the joint, uh, elaborate and refractory details, and or uh, nozzles that would complicate and extend the, uh, or, uh, the life of the joint. Final option in the turnaround plan is a new joint. Yeah, the, um, the advantages of a new joint are you can upgrade to the current technology uh, or the latest technology with two-ply testable ANCO 625 bellows. Um, you can get a full shop test, a warranty, and then also a 20 to 30 year run 
off of a new joint. Okay, that was turnaround planning, but what happens if your hot inspection turned up with an immediate problem? Uh, you have a joint leaking the atmosphere right now and you need to do something. Unfortunately for online repairs, there are only two options. One is do nothing or box the joint, and the other is an oversized clamshell. Now with an oversized clamshell, what we'll do is take that leaking bellows, we'll mount two rings on either side of it, and then mount a clamshell bellows on top of it. Now there's some conditions that you know must apply when considering an um, a oversized clamshell. Uh, the first one is that the media has to be non-flammable. Your LEL readings have to approach zero. Uh, otherwise, we can't lay, on, lay a spark on it. Also, there must be sufficient room for the two-ply testable bellows. Now, a lot of times there's tie rods or hinge or gimbal or hardware that would interfere with the, uh, the space that we need for an oversized clamshell. Oversized, online oversized clamshells are considered to be a temporary pair to get you to your next outage. That's because of the hand longitudinal welds. We won't know the quality of those welds until the welder comes down off the scaffold and we ask him how it went. And a lot of times you can have flue gas contamination or particulate contamination in the weld and so we generally recommend the oversized bellows. Uh, be only used for the remaining portion of your campaign to your next turnaround. Okay, well, and the specific process for the oversized clamshell is first to remove any sort of external covers, insulation. We'll then mount the standoff rings, weld ends, and then we'll actually mount the clamshell itself. Well, that ends our session today on outages, turnarounds, and maintenance planning and inspection. Hope you've enjoyed our session, and we hope you'll also join us for our next one. Thank you very much, and goodbye.